for joining us today. We have Seth Davies, Managing Partner here at Competitive Solutions. Uh, he will be delivering a session on equipping frontline leaders, the tools and how-tos. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us today, Seth, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Connor. Let me add my welcome to everyone that has joined us today. Uh, as Connor mentioned a, a short time ago, uh, the, the genesis of this topic of equipping frontline leaders is really a result of, of you and prior attendees. We've been doing a webinar series uh, starting back in January, and one of the questions we asked uh, at the conclusion of every webinar was, what's the hot button? What are the topics your organization is facing right now that are challenges? And really, this one kind of rose to the top very quickly, and it was one that we heard um, time and time again is that, hey, our frontline leaders right now are being challenged to do more with less. They're being pushed and pulled, being pulled uh, by their employees, the folks that report to them. Uh, and they're being pushed by the folks above them uh, in, in the senior senior management ranks of, of delivering results. So that's where we uh, we made the decision to, to move forward with a webinar on this. We did some research, did some uh, uh, talking to some of our clients and, and came up with this webinar that I want to share with you uh, for the next 30 minutes on equipping frontline leaders, uh, the tools uh, and how to's. And, and before we really get started, let's take a look at um, you know our frontline leaders. Why are they so important? Well, they make up uh, about 50, 50 to 60 percent of our management ranks. They directly manage up, up to uh, about 80 percent of the workforce. And this came from the from Harvard Business Re Review uh, earlier this year. Uh, there are the uh, direct contact uh, within our organization of, of getting the work done. These are the folks that are managing the folks, whether they're on the shop floor, uh, they're the customer service department. Uh, these are r really the conduit between salary and hourly folks uh, within, organi within the organization. They oversee the tactical execution strategy. They're the ones that take that three-ring binder, that large document that Every one, two, three years, the senior leadership team comes up with and says, here's our, our business strategy, here's how we're going to market, here's what we need to do to achieve our revenue, our growth targets with that. The frontline leaders are the ones that take that and they take it down to the tactical level and say, okay, here's what we got to do to help our organization be successful. The next one here, uh, morale and motivation is something I hear a lot about is that during these last three years, you know, the morale in organizations is down. I mean, it's been some tough economic times, uh, but the frontline leaders, that their job is kind of almost be cheerleaders to kind of rally folks together and say, hey, we've got a job to do. Uh, we need to move things forward in our organization because at the end of the day, it's about the results. Uh, and the only thing we have in common is the business. And so we need to come together collectively uh, to deliver on the results, whether the results that Wall Street wants or if we're a private company, uh, the results that our, our president, our CEO needs uh, within the organization. I'm going to pause here. Connor's going to launch our first poll, and, and I just want to get a sense of who our attendees are today on this webinar. All right, we've got about five seconds left. And as I had, uh, anticipated, it's kind of an equal balance. So we've got some frontline leaders, but, but we also have a, a large group, about 42% about of, of you attending are managers of a, of a frontline leader. So let's talk about frontline leaders and some of the challenges that they're facing that we're hearing uh, from the organizations we work with. What can't the frontline leaders control? Well, they can't control the budgets, and, and, and that's just the, the reality now is that, you know, during these this tough economic times, we're going through this recession, this downturn, whatever you want to call it, obviously revenue is not where it once was, sales aren't where, where it once was, so our budgets are smaller. So we're being asked to do uh, more with less within our organization because um, we've got reduced budgets with that, which leads to we're not able to hire people. We're not able to ramp up and get the necessary people in place. Uh, to really do an effective job. So people are, are having to really wear different hats within the organization. Competitive overseas pressure. I'm working with a company right now in, uh, in the state of New York. They are moving some of their production down to South America because the reality is the cost per unit to produce their product 
is, is significantly cheaper down in South America than it is here. So for, from a cost, from a competitive standpoint, they've got to make those, those changes within their organization. Lack of leadership skills and training, you know, it's, it's my belief that during these tough times when people are being asked to do more, more with less, this is when we need to be equipping our people, giving them new skill sets to do different jobs within our organization. But the reality of, of this is, and I've seen it over the 16 years I've been doing this, training is the first thing that typically goes uh, when the budgets get cut. Budgets get cut, get reduced, first thing to go, training goes out the door with it as well. So. Let's talk ab uh, about some of the, the, the things that they can, fit uh, they can control when faced with different challenges. They can know the mission, and they can take that mission, that vision, the goals and objectives, and they can help execute that company strategy within that. They can uh, alter their leadership style. And what I mean by this is I've got a saying that I, I want leaders, frontline leaders, senior leaders, I want them managing by process, not by personality. Because when you manage by personality, you, you can be inconsistent. It's not sustainable over the long term. But if you manage by personality, I mean, if you manage by process, you've got a defined way, standard operating procedures of how you're going to manage your people and, and how you're going to go to business, which will be sustainable over time, and then drive that consistency that our employees crave so much. The tools you use. And I'm going to share with you three tools today that frontline leaders can walk away with and start implementing, start utilizing uh, within their organizations. You know, making sure you follow the, the same processes day in and day out. And then finally, you know, how you do more with less. And, and getting that, um, getting people engaged and saying, I know we've got, we've got a lot to do, but here's what I need you to do to help us be successful. We did uh, a social media survey. We used Twitter, we used LinkedIn, a couple other avenues where we asked participants, what are the top five don'ts of frontline leaders? And here were the top five that came in uh, that I want to speak to briefly. You know, don't ignore poor performance. And when you ignore poor performance, you create an immense amount of frustration within your team. Because you've got folks, you've got Michael and Paul and Karen that are working nine, ten hours a day doing what they need to be to do to be, help the organization be successful. But then you've got some other folks, you've got Dave and Jamie that aren't doing what they need to do. They're working three, four, five hours a day, so to speak. They're not contributing. That's creating immense frustration among your team. So don't ignore poor performance. Address it. And in a moment, I'm going to share with you a tool where you can address um, people that aren't engaged. Don't micromanage. I hear this every time I had a client site. Is I don't want to be. I don't want my manager to micromanage me. What frontline leaders need to do is they need to set clear goals and objectives and let the employees go out and do it. The employees are closest to the business. Let them go out and do it. Let them do their job. And, and, and not go around on an hourly or daily basis saying, hey, give me an update on that project. Give me an update on this. The scorecard will reflect their performance with that. That will be your indicator. Every organization has got the rumor mill. And if we make decisions based on what we're hearing out there, if we make decisions not based on factual evidence, we're going to have uh, a lot more problems on our hands than we did before with that. Don't hide issues. Be truthful. Be honest with your employees. If you know there's bad news coming, communicate that. Don't hide that. And finally, don't give up on improving the way you do business. You've got to have that continuous improvement mindset that we can get better even though we're at being asked to do more or less. So what are the top five do's that we heard uh, throughout our, our survey during the month? Provide and communicate team goals. Get, tell employees what's expected of them. Put in place a scorecard process so they can see the stated goals and objectives. Here's what we need to do to help the organization be successful. Here's what we need to do in terms of productivity. Here's what we need to do in terms of quality. Here's what we need to do in terms of cost. C provide and communicate the team goals. And then I want us to talk about the team goals. Many times we measure something and we, it just gets elevated up to the higher levels in the organization and we fail to openly discuss that with our team to discuss their performance. Let them talk about how we did. What do we need to do differently within our organization, within our team? to help it be successful. Identify different communication style differences. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to share with you a tool where you can look at the different communication style differences so you can flex and frontline leaders can make adjustments when they interact. You know, Delegate and get out of the way. Trust your people. They know how to do it. Give them assignments, tasks, document it, and then let them go do it. 
and finally prioritize. Know the difference between urgent and important. Many organizations, every issue that comes along is what I call a 911. And the, the frontline leader or leader above puts on that red tape, they fly in and they save the day. Know the difference between what is urgent, what must happen today versus what's important, what do we need to get done within the next 48 to 72 hours. Eliminate a lot of that firefighting that we do in organizations because we, we don't prioritize. So I want to pause here. Connor's going to launch our next poll um, that we've got here. And in, in, in this poll, we're going to focus on um, you know, what's the, the biggest critical issue facing your frontline leaders today. Five seconds, folks. All right, and so as I had, had an, uh, anticipated with that, kind of all over the place, you know, some people mentioned tra tracking performance. Others were controlling the rumors, communication. So uh, every organization is unique in the way they, they uh, have their business, their culture. Uh, so I expect that we have a lot of different uh, answers to that question. So let's jump in and let's talk about what are the three tools that you can put in your frontline leaders toolkit, things that they can start doing immediately to impact the business and become more effective leaders within that. I talked a little about the need to, to communicate team goals. Have a scorecard, a visible representation of here's what we need to do to help the organization be successful. And then talk about how what are we doing. So on a weekly basis, whether it's close of business Friday or Monday morning before you get up and running, come together as a team. And as the leader facilitated discussion around, here's how we did last week. You can see we did good on quality. You can see we did good on productivity, production, but we missed our numbers on quality. Or maybe uh, we missed our numbers on our customer service rate. Have those discussions and talk about what do we need to do differently this week. Really analyze the business to drive that continuous improvement. Because that scorecard, in my opinion, is going to do three things for your, your employees. One, it's going to educate. It's going to provide that common business language. Of, of what's going on in the organization. So everyone knows when we talk about cost or budget variance, they know what that re uh, refers to. When we talk about returns, or when we talk about quality, we know what, the, what returns means to our business. When we talk about customer service and, and hold time, people understand what that means. And they can get their hands around it. Second thing the scorecard do, will facilitate. I talked about having a, a weekly meeting for about 20 to 30 minutes with your employees. The focus of that meeting is around the scorecard. So that's, the, that's going to facilitate a meaningful meeting to talk about how are we doing and what do we need to do differently as a result of that. And then finally, the scorecard will motivate the workforce. Because if I come in Monday morning and, I, and I'm looking at the scorecard with my team and I see that we didn't do what we needed to do last week, it's going to motivate my team to want to do better. Because if we look at our scorecard and then we look at, up at other scorecards in the organization, and we see we're the only ones that got red items on it, it's going to motivate us to want to do better. We don't want to be viewed as the team in the organization that is hindering performance, that is hindering business results. So it's going to motivate our team. So let's look at a basic scorecard template that we utilize. You'll see that first column, key business focus areas. What goes in there are what I call the, the buckets, the, the big buckets of what you're going to measure. Typically, what I see in organizations here are some of the things that under the key business focus area category. Quality cost, safety, productivity, people, customer service. Choose three to four or five of those buckets to put on your scorecard. So no matter where you go in your organization, you see those three, four, or five key focus areas on the scorecard. Next, the smart objective. This is where each team comes up with, OK, we know, that we know what we've got to do from a st strategic standpoint. Now, what's the tactical? What can we do as it relates to quality? What can we do as it relates to cost? What are the one or two SMART objectives? And SMART's an acronym. Is it specific? Is it measurable? Is it attainable? Is it relevant and timely? Let those teams come up with those scorecards. Create that ownership in that volume that says, this is our scorecard. The next is the target. What we have to be above or below to be red or green on our scorecard. What's the target number? What are we striving towards on a weekly, monthly basis? The owner, this is a very critical uh, category on the scorecard, in my opinion. 
I want some ownership of who's the person that's responsible by a predefined time, whether it's 5 o'clock on Friday or 7.30 Monday morning, to getting the data from the previous week and populating it in the scorecard. So when we come together Monday morning uh, to look at our scorecard, we've got a scorecard that's full of data that's robust and rich. And then the, the tracking frequency, I really like to see metrics looked at on a weekly basis. Uh, so if, if the train is going off the track, so to speak, you've got the ability to make adjustments uh, before it's too late. And then a visible indicator. I, I'm red or green. I've seen some companies uh, do, do smiley faces, frowny faces next to it. But I really want that visible indicator because as we see here uh, on this scorecard right now, it provides us within five to seven seconds the answer to the question, are we winning? Are we losing? It's right out front there. And you'll see a lot of green under the, under the quality category for this team that's utilizing this software PBL scorecard. You see a lot of red right there. So they know when they come together, they got to really have some good discussions around why are we red and what are we going to do about it. So let's wrap up about scorecards and what they provide within an organization. First, it provides a common language for our team members. So we all know what we're talking about. and We can all rally around the same uh, thing. This is that connectivity piece. This is where we are connecting employees to the business, where employees know, here's what I'm doing to impact the strategy, the overall mission, vision of my organization, because I've got a scorecard that links me into the greater uh, part of our company with that. It's, it's our focal point. This, this tells us what we need to do, because at the end of the day, the only thing we have in common is the business. So it's the focal point on which we rally around that. I talked a few minutes ago about ownership and buy-in and letting the team say, what are the things we can influence around quality, cost, safety, and so forth? Putting those metrics on that scorecard, letting them have that ownership and buy-in and say, hey, this is our scorecard. This isn't um, uh, the CEO's scorecard. This is the scorecard for our team, and this is what we're doing. And then finally, it gives us that clear understanding of whether we're winning or are we losing. And if you look at if you look at a at a scorecard kind of a, and let me use a sports analogy, it's the box score. You can see the you can see the red to see if we were winning or losing, but you really got to dig into it to see why did we win and why did we lose in various areas. So it creates that clear understanding of that. The second component I want to talk about, the second tool for the frontline leaders, is an action register. And in a minute, I'll show you what an action register looks like, but. It, it gives us the ability to delegate, to, to go to our different employees and say, hey, Will, I need you to do this. Rochelle, I need you to do this. And we document it. We, we put it down on there. And it helps us prioritize by, because by writing something down, we can look at it and say, is this really something that's got to happen today or is this something that can happen next, later this week? And then the third thing it will do, it will eliminate selective engagement because I can look at the action register of my team and I can see how many actions each employee has. And it tells me, am I doing a good job of distributing the workload? workload? Or do I need to remove, take some things off some employees' place and put it on other employees who have nothing to do, who aren't actively engaged? This is where you're going to reduce the frustration that you see in organizations. So the first column action, you know, what, some, what someone must do. The owner, who's that person responsible? I want individual names. I don't want the team. I don't want two or three. I don't want Connor, Dave, and Seth. I want to see one person responsible for that. And I want a target date on there. So we're tracking so people know what's expected of them on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. I have learned employees absolutely love the action register because not only are they being held accountable, but their manager, their frontline leader is being held accountable as well. So they can see everything that's going on within the team. And then the, the, the completion date, when does it need to be completed? When was it completed? Because this becomes kind of a performance management tool, so I can look to see, is Vinny completing his actions on a timely basis? And then the comments field, why was a target date missed? Well, maybe it was because uh, someone didn't call us back in time. Maybe it was because we had an emergency and one of those urgent issues come up. Well, let's just put in there the history of that action, of why things were done on time or why they weren't done on time. This is an action register for an actual team. And you'll see on there uh, quality of what a metric it applies to. Uh, does it apply to the team? It's color coded. So this really gives visibility to employees of the things that they need to be working on during the week. I want to introduce you to a, what I call a personal action register. And I like to see frontline leaders carry a personal action register with them because periodically during the day, employees will come up to frontline leaders with very benign questions such as, how much vacation do I have left? 
how much my paycheck was wrong last week. I worked some overtime. It wasn't in there. And many times frontline leaders get bogged down in administrative tasks, and it creates that culture of dependency in organizations where employee or frontline leaders are running around doing administrative tasks and really not managing the workforce. So what I like to see is for a leader to pull this pad out and, and to listen to what the employee is saying and say, I understand you want to know how much vacation you have so you can take your family on a trip. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down to uh, our HR department. I want you to go see Jay Holly. Uh, Jay handled our vacation. He'll be able to answer that question for you. And under R, I'm going to put your name. And for T, for the target date, I'm going to come. I'm going to put five o'clock today, and I'm going to follow up with you five o'clock today when we get ready to leave. And I'm going to make sure you've got that action done. So really, one, we're listening to our employees, but we're empowering them on how to solve their issues of what they need to go do to solve that issue. And then finally, that C is when was it once completed. It's a great tool that organizations have implemented uh, to break that culture, that cycle of dependency. So action registers, what are they going to provide? Well, it's going to build trust because we can de be dependent upon not only our frontline leaders, but our teammates, our, our colleagues, that we're writing down the things that people need to do. We're putting target states on there, and we're ensuring they get done. It takes a long time to build trust up. Uh, it takes one action, one thing not getting done to lose that trust. It helps bring visibility to commitments made by leaders and the team members so we can see everything that people are working on. It's a tool for uh, follow-up. Many times what happens is, is, is employee, a frontline leader asks an employee to do a task. And as an employee, I know that my leader is not going to follow up with me on that, so why should I follow through on completing that task? So it helps us make sure that those commitments get met uh, in a timely manner. And then it's true employee empowerment. And I showed you an example earlier about that personal action and how we can employ um, empower our employees to solve issues themselves. And then it's an opportunity to get everyone engaged. Let's, let's eliminate the selective engagement that I see in many teams. And let's move over to uh, what I call collective accountability, where everyone's working um, the same workload, working the same amount. And we're re reducing that frustration that I see so many times. So I want to move, transition over now to a, to a tool called the DARE. And the DARE is a communication style survey that we utilize within our uh, client companies. And what it does is it's a survey, it's 50 questions, and it helps leaders and employees uh, identify the four different communication styles. It helps improve working relationships in that uh, people now can now understand uh, some of the nuances when, when they're communicating with, with their colleagues. Uh, it helps leaders become flexible and demonstrate better communication skills because if I'm going to interface with with Ann, I can make I can make adjustments. I can flex my communication style to meet hers. Or if I'm going to interface with Renee, uh, I can I can look to see all right, what do I need to do to have a, a good, meaningful discussion with Renee on that. So let's look at the four different communication styles. The first one is driver. A driver is a person that's very uh, direct and to the point. A driver is not someone that wants to spend time in idle chit-chat of, hey, how's your weekend? What did you do? How's your family doing? A driver is someone that when you call them, they'll say, how can I help you? Or when you walk in their office to say, um, what can I help you with? They're direct and to the point with that. Uh, they're very good at making decisions quickly. They're decisive. Uh, they thrive on challenges and emergencies. But some of their, their vulnerabilities that we have to be aware of is that they're bored with a small talk. They can be impatient with emotions. Sometimes they're viewed as too blunt. So it helps to have a, a good knowledge, understanding of, of the drivers on our team. The next one are analytics. Our analytics are, um, they like a lot of data. Um, they're, they're patient, they're deep thinkers, they're process focused, they're detail oriented. Um, but when we go to work with an analytic, we need to take on lots of data and say, here's, here's the information that you requested and I'll come back tomorrow at 5 o'clock for your decision. Because an analytic, if you don't give them a deadline, they may never ever make a decision because they'll sit there and just want to keep looking at it because uh, they're a perfectionist. Um, they they uh, are, are plan versus do type of people. So if we understand um, what an analytic, what their strengths are, uh, that they're detail-oriented and they're process-focused, but also some of their, their faults, their vulnerabilities, we can flex and have meaningful discussions with them. Our next communication style is our relators. And our relators are, are ones that they're, they're well balanced. They're calming to the team. Uh, they're, they're a good mediator. They're caring. But some of their faults around that is, um, you know, they worry too much. Uh, they're not a risk taker. Uh, they avoid personal confrontation. 
Well, we're going to interface with a relator. We may want to walk into them and, and, and begin with that, what I call small, ch small chit-chat. Hey, how was your weekend? What did you do? Did you see that football game last week? Open up and spend two, three, four minutes talking to them uh, and getting those questions answered before we move over to the business reason while we're in their office. And then the final communication style is the expressive. And the expressives are, are, are fun. They bring uh, energy and excitement to our team. Um, they can talk a lot. So at times we need to, to make sure we stay focused on task of what we're talking to them about. Uh, they can be undisciplined at times. And what I mean by that is, you know, they can, there's sometimes people that can kind of hijack a meeting or hijack a topic and just start starting um, going somewhere with, with it off the, off the track. So they also interrupt each other, interrupt others. So we've got to be careful about our interactions with expressive. But all four of these communication styles, if we understand each one of them, we can, as leaders, we can communicate more effectively uh, with our employees. So if I'm going to go interface with Ann, who's an expressive, I can flex and make adjustments. If I'm going to interface with John, I can understand he's a driver. I need to walk in, give him the, uh, the information, and, and not do the chit-chat. It helps us provide feedback. Relators don't like feedback. Expressives don't like feedback. They take it personal. So if we make sure that they understand it's not, per it's not personal, but it's focused on the business, we can get there. This is not a personality tool, folks. This is a, simply a communication style inventory. It helps us understand the different communication styles uh, within our organization. I want to wrap up and talk about the three tools we just laid out for you this morning. I want to see frontline leaders have a, have a business scorecard with metrics, KPIs on there that measures are we winning or are we losing and allows them to, to make adjustments and, and drive towards uh, the overall goals and strategies within the, in the organization. Talked about action registers. It's a foundation for continuous improvement. Any metric that's read on the scorecard it goes on the action register of what they need to do differently. And then the third thing is the DARE survey. Uh, and it helps us communicate more effectively. It helps us provide feedback and recognition to our employees because they all, all employees receive information differently. They give information differently. But if we have a good understanding of that, uh, it will help us. I want to pause here. Connor's going to launch our final poll of the day uh, around which of these tools is most meaningful, most beneficial for your organization. All right, and the, the final results are coming in. It's interesting. It's, it's kind of a, a third and a third and a third in terms of the tools. A third of you like the scorecard, a third of you think the action register, and the third of you like the DARE survey. So I want to pause here, Connor. Have we received any questions during our time together? Absolutely. Lots of great questions came in. We'll get to just a couple here, and, and we'll answer the others one-on-one uh, -on -one with you. Um, here's one. Um, we were just talking about the DARE uh, communication style survey, and we had some people ask if you could give some real life examples and and how you know uh, someone used the survey and then was able as a frontline leader to uh, use their flexibility and communicate better. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give you an example of here in my office. I've got one of my uh, uh, colleagues. His name is John. John is a driver. John does not want the the, the small chat. When you walk into John's office, you walk in with here here are five bullet points for your consideration. And John will look at him, and he'll give you a decision right away. I have another employee in my office. Her name's Kathy. Kathy is a relator. Kathy likes to uh, talk about her, her family, about her children. Uh, she's got pictures of her um, two dogs on her desk. So when I go to, to interface with Kathy, I'll ask her, you know, those questions about, hey, how's your family? You know, what you do this weekend? And then four or five minutes later, then I'll get to the point of why I, what, why I'm in her office and what I need her to do. So. By understanding the different communication styles, I can make adjustments. One last question, Connor? Sure. Um, in the beginning there, you were talking about the, the top five do's and don'ts, and uh, we'd gotten that through uh, uh, social media surveys and so forth. One of the don'ts, um, we had a couple of people ask about, you know, if you could just elaborate on, um, it, you, you mentioned, don't hide issues. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, employees right now are, are, are concerned about everything that's going on in their organization. They hear about layoffs. They hear about companies closing. We need to, to be proactive and, and share all the information that's going on uh, within the organization so that employees don't have that anxiety and angst which affects workforce performance. I received a phone call this summer from a, from a company that I'm working with, and, and one of the gentlemen said, there are people in suits walking around our office. Uh, are we about to be bought? to be sold. I didn't have the answer to the question, but what it turns out was it was a new customer coming in just touring the facility. But what had happened is we had failed, the leadership had failed to communicate to the workforce. We've got some new customers coming in uh, and they want to just kind of look at look at our operation. So you know anytime you've got information relevant to employees, relevant to the business, you got to put it out there and share that with them because if you don't, you're going to have that rumor mill, that great ball, grapevine uh, just running rampant. I want to thank everyone for their time today. Um, be on the lookout next month, uh, November and December, for our Tuesday tips. We are going to pause on our webinar series uh, because of, uh, we've heard from some folks because of the holidays, because of budget planning, year-end performance reviews, just not a good time. But we're going to come back in January with a webinar on creating your 2012 scorecards. So be on the lookout for that. Also in January, uh, we've had many requests for online classes to take topics that we've talked about for for 25 minutes and expand it to you know 90 minutes or so. So we're going to do that as well. Uh, and then and always, if you have questions, you need information, you can contact us at processbasedleadership.com. We've got uh, 10 months worth of webinars uh, stored there. So if you've got 30 minutes uh, and you want to get brush up on some self-development activities, you can grab it there. I want to thank you for your time. I hope it's been valuable and beneficial. I hope you have a great Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.